Rock City Networks and ToneDeaf.com.au coming to you from Face the Music 2011. It's here at the Melbourne Arts Centre and uh, joining me, Mark Opitz. How are you, my friend? I'm very good, thank you very much. Great to be here. Excellent, excellent. Now, you're, you've, uh, there's a lot of people excited that you're here. Oh, that's great. Did you know that? Well, Can you feel that vibe, that love? Well, a couple of people have said a few things to me, which pleases me greatly, obviously. It's um, nice to be recognised for what you love to do, you yeah. know, and so uh, in that sense it's great, yeah. yeah. Now, um, I, mean, I mean, reading the, reading the bio that's, that's in, the, in the booklet um, is enough just to make you go, uh, well, I haven't really done enough in, in, in my own career, but I guess it's not to, not to compare careers, but, I mean, you... You started out at the ABC? Yeah, I started out, um, well, more so when I was in high school, it, it, it was I either wanted to be the best movie, movie director in Australia or the best record producer in Australia. So naturally, I decided to become the best movie director first. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and I went to the ABC and, and I was uh, a great place to go to because uh, I, I worked on the studio floor there and was trained in all sorts of things from... Uh, camera to editing to obviously audio but lighting and all aspects and in those days the ABC had a lot of money yeah. and so as I said you'd be sent on production courses and lots and lots of different things but um, when I ended up uh, I think after we worked at the Opera House we won an Emmy and a few things like that and I decided I really didn't want to you know, and I'd, I'd already done a film Seven Little Australians as assistant senior cameraman as well and and uh, I went back to the ABC after doing all these things, and they 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 thought that uh, it would be, because you know in the ABC there's a charter that you should be allowed to move around the entire organisation and learn as much as possible theoretically, but practically the people at the studio engineering side of it where you're you taught camera etc. and all those other things decided that I you know oh so you want to do film well guess what, now you're going to do audio. Not only are you going to do audio, we're going to make you do music audio, yeah. which was totally unpopular. And not only that, we're going to attach you to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And I said, sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I did that and f for a while. And then um, uh, after that, uh, I got my fill, as I said, with a, a few big productions that we, we worked on and, um, and then decided to um, hit up recording studios and, and, and get into... Um, recording, you know, music and, and followed the music production path being, you know, as a player as well. So, uh, and then made a list of studios, basically, and I put EMI studios at the top of the list and then to work my way down, I said, might as well start with the first one first, best one first. Lo and behold, they'd sacked some guy that day and I got in as an apprentice mastering engineer, which I was overqualified for. But so, uh, yeah, that's how it all started. Really. Yeah. Now, was that, was that apprenticeship the the Vander and Young apprenticeship, no. or did that come later on? No, no. What what happened was that uh, I, I would use every weekend to go in there and work with any band you yeah. know that I could find that was interested enough to just to to, to, to install get my own craft better. So I'd have the key and I'd go into the studio, you know, bring friends or bands in and uh, and just work stuff up and just uh, you know do demos with them. But unfortunately, one of these bands, without telling me took one of the demos I did to a, a rival record company and uh, had it pressed and made into a record and they wanted to surprise me. I bet you it was a surprise. Uh, yeah. And they walked in with, guess what, here's your first production. You know, and had this, I won't mention the band, the band's name, produced by you know, me uh, on this rival record company. And I just said, I, I just, you just don't know what you've done. You've just, you know, you don't realise that EMI Studios owns a copyright to all of us and you've just given it away and you've made me look like an idiot, basically. Yeah. And, of course, the studio management, you know, came across it as well. And they said, oh, so you're making money uh, out, of our, out, out of our spare time. You're sacked. And, you know, and I hadn't done anything wrong at all. All these guys had tried to do was surprise me yeah. with this thing. And they immediately just kicked me out after two and a half years or whatever it is. Uh, and but during that time, I'd actually as well gone and done label management with Cap for Capital Records, was running Capital Records, local label artists, local you know artists and all that sort of things. Well, not A and R, but just running the labels. But you know, then went up to become an assistant producer, as I said, with uh, the studios. And it was that point that this band did what they did unbeknownst to them, not knowing that they were yeah. 
you know, that you, that's illegal, you can't do that. Yeah. And, and so the, the, they sacked me and I, and I thought, well, that's that. You know, that's the end of my career before I even started. But a couple of guys that I'd briefly worked with in, 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 the, in the sense, and, and, and one guy in particular, Wayne DeGrucci, who was John Paul Young's manager, said oh, to Harry Vander and George Young, you've got to grab this guy. So I went in to have an interview with Harry and George, and um, they sat me down for a few hours. And in the end, they asked me, look, you know, we're looking for someone to help with the workload. Do you want to be our assistant slash apprentice? You know, don't answer now. Give us a call in, in, in 48 hours and see if you want to be on board. And at this time, you know, they're the ACDs. They're, 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 did, you, did you sleep for that 48 well, hours? Absolutely not. Yeah. You know, I, as a matter of fact, I sat by the phone. Yeah, yeah, right. Looked at my watch, 48 hours. Yep, I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And uh, first day on a Monday, I, you know, I walked in and they said, OK, you know. Uh, Mark, uh, it's George Young saying, you know, have we got a track we recorded last week, which you go and mix it for us, you know? And so I went down and it was Rose Tattoo's Bad Boy for Love. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, and I, and I go, what the, what have I bitten off here, you know? Yeah. But uh, uh, it was great, you know, because George and Harry and I became a team. We had our own studio in the Alberts Complex, which enabled us to really, um, uh, you know, I was able to pick their brains and do all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, we, I was working on... Yeah, ACDC obviously and John Paul Young loves in the air, Power Age, uh, all that sort of stuff. And then they said to me one day, we've got a band that we've tried to do, it's not working for us. Had a couple of turntable hits with them, uh, one turntable hit, but um, do you want to take them on? Otherwise we'll have to let them go. And it was a band called The Angels. And um, so, you know, I said, sure. Again, thinking I've bitten off more than I can chew. I remember going home that night thinking, what am I going to do? I went over to Wayne DeGrucci's place and was listening to you know, Graham Parker's new album at the time, which is, I thought, this is very sophisticated punk music, really. And it struck me, you know, sophisto punk. That's, and, the, and the angels are already leaning, for going from their country sort of rockish sort of sound to more rock. And so I said, well, sophisto punk, that's, the, the, that's what I'm looking for. I don't know what the sound is but I'll know it when I hear it. And so we just worked for six months every other day in studios or weekends and until I came up with a particular song uh, and I said, and it struck me, that's it, that's the sound, that's sophisticated punk music. Yeah, and then it was easy, then we did an album called Face to Face, five times platinum, out of the box, uh, very lucky, you know, but we knew what, where we were going, we had a light at the end of the tunnel and, and, and basically that's where it sort of took the, the, the Vander and Young Elberts thing took me from to there. Yeah, amazing. Um, and, and amazing to think that, you know, you were thrown in the deep end and, and, to, and to, totally. to, to, to look back at it now. Well, yeah, well to see it, the scope of it, I well, guess. Well, you don't. It, it, you, you sort of look back, uh, you know, it was only in the last couple of years that I've actually been able to look back because um, I've never ever put up all my gold records and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, my wife, Natalie, when we moved to Melbourne said, oh, you should put your records up, you know, in the office. And so I put them up and they covered every square inch of the wall. <laughs> and, and, you know, like in the Arias and, you know, ABC Countdown Awards and all that sort of stuff. And, and it struck me then, I have got a body of work. I have definitely got a body of work. And, that, and that's something to be proud of, you know, in, in that sense, to look back at what I've done. But yeah, it's, you know, it was great after Vander and Young stuff. And then I got a call from Warner Brothers asking me, two things. A, do you want to head our A&R department? And B, we've got a band called Cold Chisel. Do you want to, could you start producing? Yeah. Produce them. And I, so I did an album with them called East. And again, bang. You know, I'd done two with the Angels, which we, uh, no exit as well. They left uh, Alberts, and, and which totally disheartened, I think, Vander and Young. But the, um, and so, you know, then, as I said, Warner's asked me to run our A&R department and produce East and, uh, circus animals and you know uh, whatever you know that's so things really kicked on as a matter of fact my first day as head of A&R I tried to sign, sign this new band around town I'd seen called Inks well I thought they were Inks so it turned out to be called In Excess yeah right <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got there a day too late uh, Michael Browning and signed them to Deluxe Records and um, but I still got to produce them you know uh, about four or five albums with them so. it's, a, it's a beautiful story it's a well, you know, it's a lucky story, but I believe that, you know, luck is, as the old saying goes, where preparation meets, meets opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, but more importantly, you know, it's following your dream. And when you follow your dream, you, 
there's sacrifices you have to make. You, you know, otherwise, if you, you just can't sit on your bum and say, well, I want to follow my dream. If you're going to follow the dream, you've got to do the hard yards. Like when I first came to, to Sydney to, to get, before I got to the ABC, I was, taking, I was working the abattoirs, car washes, whatever, to, to, to keep going. And in fact, when I was working at Alberts, doing all that stuff like John Paul Young, ACDC, working with Vander and Young as my, you know, as their apprentice, so to speak. I remember George came to me one uh, just before Christmas and said, yeah, no, well, we closed the studio down over Christmas, of course, so uh, you're going away for Christmas. And I said, no, 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 I'm not George. He says, what, don't we pay you enough around here? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, don't pay me anything. He said, what do you mean? Uh, well, I've never been paid. And he looked at me aghast. He said, why didn't you say something? And I said, well, you know, after I didn't get paid for the first two weeks, I thought the, the fact that I was working with you guys was the pay. And in the meantime, I'd sold my 1935 Gibson Kalamazoo, I'd sold my 62 uh, Les Paul, you know, to, just to keep afloat. Yeah. But uh, then Ted Albert came downstairs and said, Mark, I believe we haven't been paying you, the, the legendary great Ted Albert, you know, and uh, who, you know, from Albert's, and um, with his big red book and said, uh, we're going to give you uh, $100 a week as an advance against any royalties you may make for the company. Oh, and here's $100 for what we haven't paid you. I've been there for like six months, yeah. you know, which is nothing. Yeah. That's so great. And then I can remember about two months later, uh, Ted coming down to see me with his red book again, saying, uh, Mark, according to our book, uh, uh, you owe us $800. <laughs> 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 and uh, what are you going to do about it? Uh, uh, you know, I've been working like a slave, but fortunately, um, shortly after, we were released face to face and right up until Ted died, I'd get personal notes on my royalty checks, and I still get royalties to this day from, from my work with the Angels. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a good story and a good lesson learned for everybody that faced the music that is, you know, that is here to listen to you uh, and, and taking that information. You oh, know? It, was a, it was a good lesson for me, yeah. you know, because uh, yeah, it, you know, when, you know, cause I did all this, I didn't dare go and ask for pay eh, or anything like that because I didn't go, harumph, why aren't I getting paid? I just assumed and it obviously showed me, yeah, I am doing this for the right reasons. I knew I was, yeah. but it was for love and, you know, and it, it was... I was following the dream, and the strange thing is, if you follow your dream, and you're prepared to put in the hard yards, and you're honest with yourself and everyone around you, in the end, people start throwing buckets of money at you anyway, you know, and you go, oh, are you paid for doing this? And even to, to, to this day, you know, I work overseas a lot, whether it be LA, Istanbul, London, whatever, you know, there's not a day goes by, particularly on a day off where I'm going, do you believe I get paid for doing this? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm with one of my assistants or one of my team and we're, how lucky are we, you know, we get paid to do this, you know, it's, it's so yeah, it's, um, but again, I get back to it, it's, you live one time, you follow your dream. It's good advice, it's very good advice. Now, uh, and moving on to, uh, Moving on to the other reason why you're here, uh, you have a panel discussion. I do indeed. Uh, more cowbell, which, yeah. is, which gets me pretty excited because I, I, my personal opinion is if you have cowbell, harmonica, and some sort of snare, yeah. that's a pretty good rock and roll song on my, on yeah, my it's behalf. It's true. It's pretty hard to hide the cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like hiding trumpet. Impossible. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, uh, um, but um, yeah, well, obviously more cowbell comes from that great Saturday Night Live skit about Blue Oyster Cult, yeah. which I have on my computer and I watch... Uh, uh, you know, at least once a year. Yeah. The funniest thing with, um, what's his name? I am the, uh, you know, the, the Christopher Walken plays a producer. Oh, it escapes me, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul Dickinson, is it? I think, yeah. possibly. We'll have to go. We'll it doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah, yeah. But, but the, it's, a, it's a great skit. And I believe what we're talking about mostly is, you know, the digital recording age. And uh, I'm lucky because I always you know, very much keep up with every part of the technical aspect of what we do, you know, it's, even with my engineers, I don't do a lot of engineering myself, but I, because I can do it, and I'm, I can work, do Pro Tools, all that sort of stuff, but I like to have unbelievably good experts around me that I train up to work the way I want to work, and so it leaves me free to concentrate on what I need to do in terms of arrangement, uh, that, you know, give good opinions. And that's not to say you're arranging every track that comes your way. Some stuff, it's, it's, it's stopping your people arranging, but, you know, and capturing the moment or building whatever you have to do. Now, uh, I, I think, uh, is Andy Stewart from Audio Technology Magazine in there with you? Uh, he? He's the moderator. He's the moderator, right. Mm. It'll be very interesting. Uh, you know, we got to talk to him last year, and uh, 
you know, obviously I, I, I play, what would you call it, I guess, punter's advocate or, or devil's advocate as far as, you know, I'm, I'm not in the audio technology side of things. So it's great to be able to uh, get time with yourself and people like Andy and, and to even understand it from a beginner's point of view, he's, uh, I, I think he has a great ability of uh, translating um, what most everyday people can, you know, into something they can yeah, understand, no, into layman's terms. Absolutely. So. Oh, well, I enjoy his magazine yeah. as well. And in, in, as far as my case, you know, like... It's, I'm split hemisphere, you know, I'm half audio <coughs> technology and half uh, musical because so, I have to cover the whole thing, you know, similar to a director in a movie. Mm. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a very creative job, but you've got to be on top of the basics as well at the same time about what's going on around you. You've got to know everything that's going on around you. And, I, you know, so, uh, over the years I've developed that ability to... Um, be right on top of every little thing that's going on at any particular moment in the studio, be it the arrangement, be it uh, performance, be it comfortability for the band to whatever the, the engineers or, or, or my editors are doing or anything, you know, like, and, you know, it's, it's, I, I never leave, never ever leave the studio no matter who's doing anything, you know, it's it's very important that, uh, that, that I stay on top of everything so I know exactly where I am at any given time. I know what's going to happen three steps ahead, et cetera, et cetera, but musically and technically. Yeah. So it's sort of both for me. It's, it's, it's well, it'll definitely be, I remember Andy saying before, we only have a short period of time. Uh, when I bumped him the stairs, he said, we only have a short period of time for it, but he said, you know, I wish, I wish we could make it two and a half, three hours because there'd be so much that we could, you know, mm -hmm. extract from not only the guests, but oh, al great... also to be able to, to, you know, to teach people that are attending the discussions. Well, some, well, the other people on the panel, David Briggs, Paul McKercher, I mean, you know, it's a nice, nice cross-section. Yeah. You know, the, the, you know, but yeah, those two guys are very creative people, you know, and obviously Briggs, a guitarist with a uh, little root band for years. Uh, Paul McKercher, great producer, engineer, and was also, I think, second cello for the Tasmanian uh, Youth Orchestra as well. Mm. So it's, you know, we all, uh, hope between us all we can sort of, you know, make some sense and, and, um, and impart whatever knowledge that anybody would like to have. I really hope the audience is actively involved in that aspect, you know, in asking questions. Well, it'll be a very interesting panel discussion to attend, so hopefully we can get down there and have a look at it ourselves. It might clear up a few uh, few things for me as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not all smoke and mirrors. No, it's not. All right, Mark, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, Mark Opitz. Now, if you want any more information, you actually have a website, markopitz.com, right? I do indeed. All right, well, head to that if you want any more information on Mark. I'm sure everything's there that... Uh, yeah. Th that you need to find out about. Well, and, you can always email me. Or you can email Mark yeah, as well. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be it's, there. It's pretty easy. All right, uh, Mark, thank you very much for joining us. It's Mark Oberts here from Face the Music 2011 for Rock City Networks and tonedef.com.au.